The senior team of a large organisation not so long ago had been assigned an important job by the owners to sell part of the business. This organisation was mature and successful. The senior team was highly experienced. But the sale wasn't getting off the ground. In fact, all status reports pointed to a projected loss on the sale. So a coach was brought in and the problem began to reveal itself. The tools and techniques they were deploying were right and their staff were well trained. But for some reason, competent staff weren't cooperating across divisions, particularly when it came to sharing information between operations and finance. The leadership team hadn't intentionally directed this lack of cooperation. However, they had been so used to prioritising activity within their own divisions that they were inadvertently modelling a culture of silos and blame. While you could probably say that accountability was high within divisions, overall the collective culture was low accountability. Looking a little deeper, the coach uncovered some more insights into the behaviour of the senior team that was creating this accountability gap. The finance and operations execs didn't play too well together. The HR director spent way too much time listening to each executive moan about each other and the chief left the executives to sort it out amongst themselves. So with this new level of awareness, the chief was coached to call out the unproductive behaviour. Finance and operations were coached to get over themselves and HR was coached to step away from being complicit in this passive aggressive warfare and instead broker a more accountable relationship between finance and operations. Because the senior team were highly motivated to partake in the rewards of a profitable sale, this coaching conversation was just what they needed to catalyse action. And they changed their behaviour real quick, adopting a new keystone accountability habit of walking the talk across the organisation for real, despite it being uncomfortable. Staff followed this lead with very little coaching. The sale went through with a handsome profit, Unions were on board and leaders kept their reputations intact. This could be any leadership team anywhere, but I'll tell you this story as it happens to be my story. My name is Di Worrell, the author of Accountability Leadership. And I was the director of HR, and this was one of the most defining lessons of my career. I decided then that my path was the world of business strategy change and transformation, and that high accountability cultures are pivotal to sustained high performance. I understand that you're well on your way through your own accountability journey at Broad River Retail. I want to acknowledge the fact that you're taking the time out to take stock of what's working. It sounds like you've achieved a whole bunch of important accountability milestones already. I also want to acknowledge the courage it takes to identify when things aren't going to plan. At this stage in the journey, it's normal to experience some teething problems and frustrations as your organisation pushes back on change. Your resolve is no doubt being tested. Not only do you need to modify your behaviour and put new practices in place, but you have the added pressure of being the champion of changing the behaviour of other people. Now, I suspect some of your stakeholders have more impact on the success of this effort than others. For example, established salespeople can have a disproportionately high level of influence on others at the coalface. They're typically the poster child on how we do things around here today, which may be different to how you want things done in the future. So they must take more of your focus and effort to win over, considering their position of influence. I find that leaders of business and cultural change can draw on five practical steps for getting buy-in and ongoing sustainability for change. Leave a step out and you're likely to buy yourself problems down the track. It's never too late to backtrack. These steps aren't necessarily linear because the journey of change to a new way of working in any organisation is not a straight line. Step one. Build awareness of the change. This is where you're socialising the idea for the first time. You've already done this. As you were socialising the idea, salespeople would have been thinking, does this idea fit into my previous experience of how to be successful in this business? Based on my experience, could it work? 
Take a moment to ask yourself whether in socialising this concept you answered these four questions. One, what is the change? Two, why are we doing it? Three, what's the same? And four, what is different? Step two, fuel desire for this new way of working. This is where salespeople will be asking themselves, am I willing to give this a go? What's in it for me? By connecting salespeople with the what's in it for them, you take a key step towards getting their buy-in for change. Until this point, you have only told them, I promise you, despite how many nods of agreement you get, there is no buy-in yet, no emotional connection. This step is an important demonstration of positive accountability through genuine engagement. Because instead of leaving the message as a request to do as I say, the what's in it for me process transmutes the message of change into an invitation for people to make their own connection with the journey. This is where you put your sales skills to work. Shift gears from telling to pitching the idea for change and then selling the benefits. You also get to unpack how you're going to mitigate the disbenefits, if any. Have you really listened to staff about their thoughts on whether this is going to work without judgment? Are there any gaps that need to be addressed? Through this conversation, you'll get really clear on whether the behaviour change you're asking for is really going to move the needle towards the better performance outcomes you want. Step three, provide knowledge. Salespeople will be wanting to know exactly what it is that they'll need to learn. This is where you organise briefings, trainings, demonstrations, whatever is appropriate. You could also involve salespeople or other influential staff to participate in creating and delivering the training. In the training, you need to teach the technical skill, whatever that is, but also what does good look like? How will success be measured? What will be the consequences of not following the new way? And when will the new way of work be kicking in? This is where you get to ask yourself two challenging questions. How are you rewarding the new behaviour? But how are you disincentivizing the old behaviour? As any good trainer will tell you, training doesn't produce competency though. The right training plus the right practice produces competency. So that's why there's a step four, coaching for ability. Salespeople who've been through training will now be asking themselves, do I now have the capability and competence to do this or not? This is a golden opportunity to road test what they've been asked to do or learn. But the crux here is that the road test must occur in a safe environment. A safe environment is where you can practice without judgment, make mistakes, receive coaching and feedback and take corrective action before the new competency is expected to be mastered and applied. Remember that developing mastery is a process. Step five, the final step, reinforcement. Salespeople, like any influential group of people involved in change, may test your resolve from time to time. This is when your accountability coaching muscles really get a workout. What confronts a lot of leaders at this stage is that sense of trepidation you get when you need to provide constructive or corrective feedback, especially with highly valued and influential people. A positive culture of accountability doesn't mean you're prevented from offering feedback. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Feedback, feed forward and follow through are pivotal to a culture of high accountability. Now's a good time to reflect on your skills around accountable conversations as we bring this home. Not all accountable conversations are confronting, but some certainly can be, as you know. As with any skill, the more you can prepare within a frame of reference, the more equipped you will be and the more confident you will feel. This is a whole workshop in its own right, but let's just look at a classic example you might find in a sales environment. Salesperson X historically promises discounts that cut into profits in order to earn commissions. The business has pulled back on this practice in order to better meet profitability targets. The senior manager has accountable conversation number one with salesperson X about sticking to the pricing guidelines, which salesperson X promises to adhere to. Senior manager then learns that salesperson X has gone ahead anyway and discounted outside of the guidelines. The senior leader now has accountable conversation number two. 
which addresses a different accountability issue about the salesperson not following through on a commitment. The accountable leader might start this conversation by being curious with something like, I'm curious. We had a conversation about sticking to the new sales targets, but I see you've discounted anyway. Tell me about that. This approach gives room for a leader to call out the behavior, but also find out constructively why this has happened, unpack what of steps one through fee four may have been missed or needs reinforcement. I want to close out this case with a challenge. If you were this leader and the curiosity conversation fails to realign the behaviour and a commitment is again breached, what's your next move? Have you sat down ahead of time to identify the incentives and disincentives in your kit bag of compelling consequences? Bearing in mind your HR policies on these matters, if you've exhausted all avenues and staff persist in doing things their own way, will you have the resolve to take a definitive action to move them out of a position of influence? In closing, I want to remind you that behavioural change doesn't happen through an email, a sales meeting, a training course or in one conversation. It takes commitment, time, coaching and consistency. And the five steps of leading business and cultural change of awareness, desire, knowledge, ability and reinforcement can help you stay the course. It's been my great pleasure to spend some virtual moments with you today. I hope you found a few tips that you can take away and put into practice. And all the best on your journey to greater performance through a culture of accountability.